so thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here on the last day of this conference, which um, has been incredibly stimulating. And um, I'm not sure this paper is going to be quite as sexy as the last paper, but I think there have been a, a lot of discussions about gender disparities in eating across different civilizations and across periods of time. So I hope this will contribute to that broader discussion. Um, I'm thinking about the 20th century. So um, in Britain in the 1920s and 30s, definitions of civilization and barbarism are the subject of scholarly and public debate. The civilization barbarism binary spans discussions of economic and political ideology, physical health, psychoanalysis, and the creative arts, among other things. And uh, contemporary historians like Richard Overy recently have argued that a sense of crisis in Britain was more prevalent in the interwar period than before the First World War. And Overy argues that, quote, this awareness can be seen as a central element in explaining Britain's readiness in the end to engage in a war in 1939 in which it was generally believed civilization would be saved or lost. So in this paper, I'd like to examine what civilization means for Virginia Woolf, asking how her writing on food and gender and the archival evidence that I have found helps help us address this question. So in my doctoral thesis, which is on the representation of food in British and American modernist literature, um, I'm writing a chapter on Virginia Woolf's use of aesthetics and politics in her writing about food. And today I'll consider the connections between the institution, in this case Cambridge, of education and food, and particularly the meals that Woolf ate during her two lecturing engagements at Cambridge, um, lightly fictionalized in her essay, A Room of One's Own. And while dining at King's College and Newnham College, Cambridge, which in this essay are disguised as Oxbridge and Furnham, Wolf's observation of fellows and students comprise the experiment from which she writes her analysis of the importance of well-prepared food, literal and figurative, um, to literary work. And Wolf's reflection on the economics of food and the further details I will provide here of the extent of the financial discrepancies at men's and women's colleges demonstrates how closely Wolf's aesthetic thinking about fiction is tied to social history. Um, and for the sake of economy, I'll put the famous passages describing the meals in question up on the PowerPoint for your reference, but I won't re read these out loud. And I hope that many of you are at least vaguely familiar with the room of one's own. It's kind of a cultural icon, so I won't explain it too much. But at the end, if you need to ask any more questions, you can. So in October 1928, Wolf turned her attention to the material and economic realities of the food at the Cambridge Colleges of Newnham and Girton, which are women's colleges, which she visited to deliver her women and fiction lectures, which were later expanded into a room of one's own in 1929. The conversation around food in this work starts early on with a now famous extended anecdote of an extravagant luncheon at a men's college and a meager dinner in hall at a women's college. Wolf's depiction of the food at the women's colleges emphasizes the outcome of such food. What kinds of students, thinkers, writers, and artists will these colleges produce? And she fears for the future creative generations. In her diary, she recalls the women at Cambridge as being, quote, starved but valiant, intelligent, eager, poor, and destined to become schoolmistresses in droves. <laughs> um, and in A Room of One's Own, she muses on this inequality uh, between the men's and women's colleges. And her darkly humorous take on the situation is revealed through a passing scientific anecdote. I have seen a dairy company measure the effect of ordinary milk and grade A milk upon the body of a rat. They set two rats in cages side by side, and of the two, one was furtive, timid, and small, and the other was glossy, bold, and big. Now, what food do we fit, feed women as artists upon? So um, the timeline in A Room of One's Own has been altered slightly so that the better meal at Cain's comes first. In reality, Wolf visited Newnham College first on the evening of 20th of October, 1928, for her dinner and lecture. And then she had lunch at King's College the following day. So that's the women's college and then the men's college. She came back to Cambridge a week later to speak at Gurdjian College, another women's college, um, but did not dine in hall. And for the sake of comparing the archives with Wolf's text, I will follow the order of events in a room of one's own. So some of my discussion today is about the legacy of record keeping. The large number of account books and menus dating back to the 1500s 
um, King's College was founded in 1441 at the King's College archives are themselves indicative of the amount that has been spent preserving them. And at the women's colleges, in contrast, the archives more generally, but particularly those regarding food, are characterized by significant gaps. But in what I have been able to compare, there is evidence to suggest that Wolfe actually understates the tremendous difference between the wealth of the men's and the women's colleges and the quality of the food in the, in the late 1920s. Um, by examining the financial and culinary records available, we come to see that Wolfe's portrait of food in Cambridge is not a matter of difference in preparation or presentation, although that does matter, but also of the quality and amount of basic ingredients budgeted per person. So we see the stark differences in eating, living, and studying at a men's versus a women's college, a significant point for 20th century feminist as well as material history. Um, so the meal at the men's college, Oxbridge, in the text um, described in this slide, was not held in King's College Dining Hall. Rather, it was undertaken in the private rooms of George Dady Rylands at King's College. Rylands was a great friend of the Wolfs, who had briefly worked at the Hogarth Press with them, and then was appointed a fellow at King's. Although records at King's indicate that private dining in your room, having food delivered to your room, was not uncommon for undergraduates and fellows, this private meal would be better than what would have been on offer in the general dining hall. However, this private meal at Ryland's expense is still a kind of institutional meal in that it is prepared and delivered in the institutional context, bridging private and public economies. Uh, so few records remain of Wolfe's 21st October 1928 lunch with Ryland's, but a Wolfe scholar, Jane Marcus, spoke with Ryland's with him at the um, 65th anniversary of Wolfe's lectures at Cambridge. So I hope you got a bit of a sense of this when we go to the next slide. Um, the luncheon table was set with Dady Rylands. This is uh, now present day, the 1990s. Uh, the luncheon table was set with Dady Rylands valuable collection of China as then, though no partridges appeared. So if you have the, the partridges, um, like a couple of brown, that have many and various, with so a retinue of sauces and salads, right? That's in the wolf text. So, um, no partridges appeared in the, the 1990s, but Dady Rylands said it was out of that window that w Virginia would have made up seeing the Manx cat, which is a, a passage in the text. She was good at not getting things right. She made up this passage. How, he chuckled, could partridges be many and various? So Rylands, in retrospect, jokingly doubts Wolf's memory, but it is a bit silly to accuse Wolf of inventing the meals in this semi-fictional work. So this representing her experience, but she also renames the colleges. King's College becomes Oxbridge. Women's College becomes Fernham. She is thinking novelistically, a flouting a tradition about which she is wrong. That, quote, it is part of the novelist's convention not to mention soup and salmon and ducklings, as if soup and salmon and ducklings were of no importance whatsoever, as if nobody ever smoked a cigar or drank a glass of wine. So Wolf jokingly and conveniently forgets that there is a long tradition of novelists, and as we've seen, I suppose, um, of poets well back, um, celebrating meals and describing them in great detail, as Dickens did in A Christmas Carol, or as Proust does in A la Recherche de Temps Perdu, or as Joyce had done in Ulysses in the same year as Wolf, in the same year as Proust, and in The Dead in his um, collection, 1914 collection, Dubliners. So although she did have predecessors, Wolf emphasizes food in a room of one's own because she believes food is the missing part of the great intellectual drama of writing, of good conversation, and of education. And here, as you will see, she would prefer women to take a greater part in that drama. Um, so back to the archives. Unlike the women's colleges, men's colleges operated at a profit in the 1920s, at least. Um, a report at King's College that I have examined from a professional accountant in 1928, suggests that the private meals that were on offer at King's were in fact less lucrative for the college than the more efficient hall dinners. And the accountant recommended that because the hall dinners and fixed price luncheons provide most of the profits of the kitchens, something might perhaps be done to increase profits by offering inducements to the undergraduates to take the fixed price meal in place of the private luncheon served to rooms. Um, so I'm gonna show you this, what I, this table I've compiled from looking at the accounts of what's been being spent um, at King's College, Cambridge in 1928. And I could only convert it to 2015 money, but it's about the same, 2016 money. Um, 
So this report provides a snapshot for the overall spending on food at the college. Um, you can see this includes wine and beer, wine, spirits, beers, um, and cigarettes and tobacco. Um, so there's a, a lavish expenditure, a lavish budget for, for spending on the, on the fullness of meals and, and the full range. Um, the precision of these records reflected in the neatly typed and bound leather volumes of a London accountant's yearly reports is a sign of how important the economics of food was to King's College and also the importance that they profit from its sale. Now, I have no way to validate Wolf's description of what she called the fish and cream and the partridges and sauce um, with salad and dauphinoise potatoes um, and meringue with a menu or a bill from Ryland's lunch. I don't have I don't have an exact record from that, and neither did the college. But at the King's College archives, I could find Dady Rylands' wine bill from that term, uh, which equated to about 300 pounds in today's money, um, and it was about 40 pounds more extravagant than it had been, more expensive than it had been uh, the previous term. So it's possible he spent more on wine uh, because of this lunch, hosting this lunch with Wolf. Um, but this is all speculation. Um, but while we can't compare a wine bill with Wolf's description, um, it is true that the amount that Dady Rylands personally spent on wine in a single term is more than Gurchin College, another woman's college, spent on fish for the entire year in 26. So there is a comparison to be made. Um, so the next comparison. Uh, this is the dinner at um, the com composite women's, fictional women's college, Fernham, based on Noonan and Gurchin. So in her diary entry from the 27th of October in 1928, Wolfe blends the Noonan and Gurton lectures into one, recalling them with a self-deprecating tone. I blandly told them to drink wine and have a room of their own, she said. And despite her thinking about the lectures as one and blending them into one, the meal at Fernham, the women's college in a room of one's own, is based on an actual dinner that Wolfe ate in hall at Noonan College. Um, however, I did go to both colleges, to Noonan and Gurton, to investigate the state of the records on food for the sake of comparison. And there are significantly fewer records of the costing of food at Noonan and Gurton, but there are actually several um, subjective reflections on the quality of the food, uh, especially in response to the publication of Wolf's text, which is very interesting. And the, the food at Noonan had apparently never been particularly good. So this is, a, you can see, it's not very good in Wolf's description. Um, a Noonan alumna of 1920, before Wolf had even gotten there, uh, said this. The food was not good. It was badly cooked. It used to be brought over on trolleys quite a long time before the meal was going to be served and kept hot, which meant that if it was something that could dry up, it did dry up. At any rate, it was overcooked and not very nice, and often there was not enough. Um, the literary scholar Elsie Duncan Jones, who was then a student, recalls the actual dinner with Wolf. She says, as I remember it, she was nearly an hour late, and dinner in Clough Hall, never a repast for gourmets, suffered considerably. Mrs. Wolf also disconcerted us by bringing a husband and so upsetting our seating plan. <laughs> and Elsie Duncan Jones's reaction to Wolf's description of the Furnham dinner in her text was typical. Um, Quote, her purpose was, of course, to evoke pity for the poverty of the women's colleges. This is Duncan Jones. But at the time, it made us, her hosts, decidedly uncomfortable. And this, is a, this is a tension that runs throughout the text. How do you improve things without people, making people feel bad? <laughs> um, another alumna recalls Wolf and the Newnham Literature Society taking tea in her room after the, quote, famous or infamous dinner when prunes and custard were eaten and wine was not drunk. Well, so Wolf's short and abrupt sentences, as in this example, um, emphasize the quotidian nature of this meal. Everybody was assembled in the big dining room. Dinner was ready. Here was the soup. You can see that. It was a plain, very soup. These short sentences. Prunes and custard follow. Um, and then she contrasts the meal with the lavish, elegant lunch that you saw first, with Ryland's, with the china, the quality of the ingredients, um, and the presentation. Um, so at the Noonan, um, Noonan and Gurchin archives, either no professional accountants' reports exist or they have not survived. And so it is hard to know precisely what was served on a regular basis. Um, because financial records were kept in cash books, I am able to make some comparison 
of the amount of food spent across the colleges. There is, however, far more material available, as I've mentioned, on students' attitudes towards food at the women's colleges. And I didn't encounter any of these at King's. So I think this is another important gender difference, the subjective reflection, and also thinking about ways in which you can possibly improve things, too. So my next slide is um, uh, from the 1st of November, 1926, and it's the principal of, of Newnham College, Pernell Strachey, and She's noting this in her handwriting in her minutes of the House Committee. So, Miss Dale asked if it would be possible for meat to be carved at instead of before dinner, and if gravies could be put on the tables instead of being served on the meat plates by the housekeeper. I will continue with this kind of preoccupation. How can we improve this kind of institutional food? I have institutional problems. How do you serve a lot of people at once, and how do you make it reasonably hot and reasonably tasty, and how do you cater to individuals in that setting? Um, at the final sentence, after some discussion, it was agreed to try having gravy on the tables and one in hall to begin with. Um, I think hints at the arguments that preceded the compromise. So, uh, as a Wolf Scholar, I'm, I'm fascinated in this. I know this might be a little bit um, minute for non Wolf Scholars, but I think it's important for how we how we think about food in this context of civilization. What does it mean to think about? food being civilized and, and, and education, food serves at educational institutions contributing to our discussion of, of what, it, what 20th century ideas of civilization mean. So I'm taking you to Girton College because there's some, some more, um, there's a, the students started their own suggestion book for how things could be improved, um, which I think is very interesting. Uh, so throughout A Room of One's Own, Wolf references her aunt, Lady Barbara Stevens, 1927 book, Emily Davies and Girton College, which is about the founding of Girton College in 1869. Sybil so herself has uh, familial ties to these institutions and the founding of them and is deeply invested in what the legacy of these women's colleges is, what it means for women to be able to be educated at the university level. So from this book by Barbara Stephen, Wolf draws the, the metaphor of a room of one's own and takes from it that fundraising for the college for Girton College was precarious. Quote, it was only after a long struggle and with the utmost difficulty that they got 30,000 pounds together. So obviously we cannot have wine and partridges and servants carrying tin dishes on their head. And when Wolf asks in her essay, what had mothers been doing then that they had nothing to leave us? Many of her readers were offended that she'd asked the question at all. Professor Mur Muriel Bradbrook wrote, quote, we undergraduates enjoyed Mrs. Wolf, but felt her Cambridge was not ours. Um, so to think about Girton, which is the second college that, that Wolf visited, but just doesn't differentiate in her, her text, um, I, I went to this uh, food suggestion notebook, um, and it's from a later period, it's from 1939, so it's, it's during rationing, um, but as there was only very sparse records available, we have to look at um, from the general period, records from the general period. So. Um, this Lent term food committee book from 30, 1939, um, students could put in requests for changes or make complaints, as you see here. Um, and uh, another common request, as uh, instead of just requesting particular food, was to request that maybe they be cleaned better or there be a change in the practice of how they're being prepared. So, um, and they were thinking about vitamins, which only recently been discovered. So, but they're pretty clued in. Um, but uh, the food suggestion of a good, um, at Gertrude continues, and in Michael's term 1941, four students asked, quote, that the caterpillars be removed from the cauliflower before they reach their plates. <laughs> really shocking. So if the treatment of vegetables at Gertrude was similar to their presentation at, at the dinner at Noonan in 1928, and even remotely, then Wolf would not have been exaggerating when she said that her sprouts were curled and yellowed at the edge, and hopefully there weren't any. Hopefully she wasn't being too diplomatic to mention any dirt or um, caterpillars. But so, in conclusion, um, I have been trying to show how this example of Wolf's reflections on food and gender inequality can be considered as part of the broader discussions of civilization as a concept in the early 20th century. For Wolf, contemporary civilization is partially defined by what is absent who and what are left out of it, and in the examples I've shared today, sometimes that's women. However, Wolf's defense of women is not intended to be antagonizing or alienating. In her later work, 1938 work, Three Guineas, 
which is an epistolary essay which draws a parallel between contemporary political instability in Europe and the patriarchal subordination of women within British society, Wolf embraces the idea of a society of outsiders who might critique and reimagine civilization, redefining it for themselves and others. So Wolf's thinking about society comes simultaneously from within and without, as a member herself of the educated class with familial, familial links to founders of Gurchin College, um, but also in a forward-looking generative sense, asking what can civilization be? What potential does it hold for women as, and outsiders? And my archival research in relation to A Room of One's Own shows that, if anything, Wolf may have been understating the starkness of the d- difference between the quality of the food at the men's and women's colleges. But her reasons for discussing food at all could be further explored. She was not critiquing the hospitality of the students, the fellows or the cooks, as the women at the colleges sometimes believed when reading the descriptions in A Room of One's Own. Rather, she was critiquing the financial histories that allowed such a discrepancy, using food to support her point about inequality and its effects on women's lives and a sense of their own opportunities. For Wolf, civilization is a state of mind and a state of society that depends on material goods and financial stability. Wolf's hope that women would aspire to and achieve a room of their own and 500 pounds a year comes not from a position of luxury and privilege and not from social snobbery. Rather, it stems from a desire for equality of opportunity, for women to have an equal chance to attain greatness. They too require comfort and security. Wolf's vision informs her approach to literary modernism, affecting the language she uses to describe food, whether that food is prepared and served with the trappings of wealth and empire, served with wine, champagne, and cigarettes, or whether it has been procured cheaply from a muddy market with string bags, plainly cooked, and served without pomp on plain china with water to drink. Uh, If we just take a minute to reflect back on some of the many other papers that at this conference, um, a common theme that good, we've seen a common, a common theme that good food, flavorful food, and also forbidden food, influence individual human character, national character, the character of leaders and tyrants. And coming at this discussion from a literary perspective, I hope I've demonstrated Virginia Woolf's take on the food and character question uh, through the example of how young women at Cambridge were fed and what kinds of questions this raises about creativity and possibilities for new kinds of civilization. Thank you very much.